welcome to tonight's episode of the Group Therapy Podcast. Today's guest is uh, the current editor in chief of Source Point Press, uh, Joshua Werner. Um, you just got that job uh, relatively recently, right? Yes. Yeah. Absolutely. It's um, uh, it's exhausting. <laughs> Um, t- tell us a little bit about yourself. So um, I am, uh, uh, I come from a creative background as, a, as both an artist uh, and a writer. And um, uh, I also co-founded uh, where I am for a long time. And then when we um, turn into summer at Oxide Media, where we do a source point press and some other smaller companies, we, um, I started doing production management on, on the board game division in addition to art direction um, for, uh, for source point and managing a lot of our editorial stuff and project managements. And it's, uh, I, I wear a lot of hats basically. And I kind of jump in on creative endeavors wherever I'm needed. And, uh, and now uh, as a most recent, I'm uh, editor in chief. So I'm kind of controlling the, the direction of the comics going forward and, it's uh, it's pretty fun. It's it's like getting to see my dream come true, honestly. Well, now, um, where did you get started at? What was where, where did you start in comics at? In time, I. Oh, am I breaking oh. up? Yeah, you're breaking up a um, little bit. There we go. Yeah, get a little close for my Wi-Fi. Um, so I, I went to uh, I went to art school and. During that time, I had kind of swore off the idea of going into comic books. It was pretty much, uh, it, was a, it was a no-go. Everybody was like, that's a terrible idea. There's no money in comics. Like, if you want to make money as an illustrator, I can show you other avenues in this industry. And then um, uh, I ended up transferring schools. And uh, when I went to my second college, I, I had a couple, uh, a couple pretty big name comic professors who worked in the industry that were just really inspiring to me, uh, like Timothy and who would, um, who'd worked on, uh, Jack and Conan, the barbarian and all these amazing titles, uh, Bob McLeod, who had worked on S- Superman among other things. And, uh, I kind of started easing back in that direction. Um, I, when I graduated college, I was kind of freelancing for different publishers doing just spot illustrations for books and doing book covers. And then they realized that I had a really, I was really strong with graphic design in addition to illustration. So I started doing like book cover layouts. And then next thing you know, I was doing pre-press and uh, uh, I started working for Gary Reed, um, who was uh, uh, the founder of Caliber Comics, yep. uh, as well as other companies. And this was, be- this was not a while caliber was around caliber had had shut down and then it came back later this was before the comeback and um i was doing just weird little gigs for him uh and then uh i was continued doing those as caliber came back um and it was during that time that i was like starting to realize like my kind of love this i i've always loved comics i've loved comics since i was a kid i've always loved it that the industry and the fandoms and i love playing in other people's sandboxes as much as I love building my own. And uh, I just kind of got sucked back in and decided that to try my hand at, at publishing. And um, I figured I'm, I'm working for other publishers. I get a, I'm the one behind the scenes who, you know, knows how to do all these different things. Why not? And then uh, I quickly found out why not. It is much harder <laughs> than I ever could have imagined. Um, and uh, it's, it just kind of grew from there though. Cause I was very, persistent and uh kind of kept it kept kept it rolling i was working a full-time job for years while while also working you know at source point not taking a dime from the company just every dollar going right back into it and uh, i got to the point where my my other design job i had to uh negotiate time off because the convention schedule was getting so heavy so I was starting to work less days a week during the convention season so that I could be on the road more. I was negotiating more vacation time. And then during the off months, I was working six and seven days a week at the design gig to make up for all the other times that I had taken time off. And uh, the two just kind of started rivaling each other. Uh, and then eventually 
I got to make it my full-time job and actually, you know, collect a salary to, <laughs> to, to do only that. And, uh, thank God. Cause it's like a 60 hour work week. I don't know if I have any room left for side gigs. <laughs> yeah. uh, um, so you've worked for Gary Reed. That means you're Midwest boy, right? Yes, sir. That's yes. right. <laughs> um, I, uh, I did an interview, uh, before the show became a, uh, uh, internet show. I did a, um, uh, public access show years ago. And I did an interview with Gary, uh, I want to say it like Motor City or something like that. And then for like the longest time, every year at Christmas time, he'd just send me a box full of books. Oh, so that's awesome. I still got like the Christmas card somewhere in my collection that he would, you know, hand sign a Christmas card, put like four or five signed books in a box and send them off to me every year for like, I don't know, like five or six years. And so uh, cool. yeah, he was a pretty cool dude. Um, no, my cat's deciding it wants to visit. No, not my cat, my wife's cat. Come on, you do not need to be on the books. So, all right, sorry about that. <laughs> uh, then, uh, really, but um, you you were talking about working in pre press and stuff like that. It's funny because I I worked in a printing company uh, before I ran a comic book oh, store full time. Okay. So. I know what pre-press is setting up and stuff like that is all so much fun. <laughs> yeah. A lot of tedious work, especially when you're juggling just numerous comic books a month, uh, all coming from different artists at different levels of background. There, there are some phenomenally talented, incredible artists who just still, after years of doing this for a living, don't really know the proper specs for comic book pages. <laughs> like there's just incredible amount of things that, that go into making a comic printable that people don't realize. Well, I think it's funny is I know people that are, you know, have been artists for years and outside of doing their, you know, their own books, they're out there pounding, you know, out, out at the conventions, doing all this stuff like that. But they, they're like, okay, well, this is how I'm going to make it big. I'm like, have you ever turned in any artwork to another publisher they're like oh i did once and i got turned down i'm like i knew people who got turned down at like chicago by 20 different publish publishers and that 21st publisher hooked them up and they got uh, you know got page work out of that and so you know you gotta keep pounding it out so um so true oh yeah <laughs> Um, what books are you currently working on? Are you doing anything outside of being the editor in chief right now? So, um, right now I'm, I'm writing a, uh, a one shot comic for the Winchester mystery house, uh, our, our three issue first volume wrapped up, uh, with issue three coming out today mm -hmm. and for free comic book day, uh, in 2022, um, Diamond was very interested in, in doing uh, an exclusive story about the Winchester Mystery House. So uh, I'm, I'm working on that right now, wrapping that script up so we can get, um, we can get the art rolling on it. And then um, I've been greenlit with, uh, with, with Winchester Mystery House to work on volume two with them. I've just um, seen this also in the new preview. Yeah, isn't it? I'm so excited. What did you think of the cover? It's uh, looking pretty good. Okay. I like that cover a lot. It, it was kind of a neat concept. The idea of just like doing this massive, just it says hundred for those who haven't seen it, it says hundred year curse and huge letters across the, 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 the front of the cover. And you see the house through the letters. It's kind of like a knockout effect. Uh, uh, so on top of, of on writing a bunch of those right now, I'm also writing um, uh, it's unannounced. So I'm not going to say what it is yet, but it's a, uh, it's a licensed, uh, children's it's based on a, a, a children's show on netflix uh i'm writing um a, some comic book stories uh for some like kids graphic novels uh it'll be it'll be in comic shops but it will also be aiming strategically for for bookstores um and trying to really kind of hit a certain age range and i'm really really excited about it um i've been talks with a a, a phenomenal um artist that i want to work with on it and um, i'm pretty pretty excited uh, doing, doing more kids stuff is something I'm really, I'm really passionate about right now because, uh, we have our, our current audience 
it, a lot of them have kids that are now kind of 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 that age. And you know, I've been doing this for for ten years. So in that time, a lot of the the readers who stuck around, who were there from the beginning. Um, they have kids that are buying comics, like, and they didn't have those before. So I really, it's, it's more important to me now than ever to kind of try to hit both audiences at the same time. I want so badly for a parent who's really into short titles to be able to go to the store and then grab a different source point title for their kid while they're there and go home together and read comics. Like that's just, that's the dream right there. Um, so I've been, I've been kind of working on, um, on sourcepointkids.com, uh, which is, it's basically, uh, it's a curated selection from our website that it's trustworthy. So parents don't have to wonder going through our titles, what's okay for their kids and what isn't, uh, because so much of our stuff is, is definitely mature. So uh, it, it basically, we, we have a separate logo that I designed and, uh, and a separate website. So any of the kids' titles um, will take you to a site that is just safe you know parents don't have to worry about it and um they're like okay cool if you if you found the website in this comic then with that logo on it then anything else you see on there you're good to get and uh and so i'm kind of uh i've got my feet in both worlds right now working on kids content and adults content at the same time uh which is fun i love both yeah um now do you do you run into any problems because i know like i said i just i pulled up holliston there um do you, how much work do you deal with, with Adam Green and stuff? Do you, or do they just basically let you guys have free reign or do they have to, you have to like push things past them, let them see it or. Um, Adam is fantastic to work with. He's excellent. He, Holliston is his baby. Um, it's very much um, meant to be semi-autobiographical about his own life and his own like early, you know, years of trying to become a filmmaker. And, and so it's really near and dear to him. And when the show was, was actively being filmed and they were starting to get into season two, Adam was struggling to kind of, um, to be the star of the show and to also be, you know, co-producing and, and really trying to put all this together and, and be the creator and write all of the episodes. And so he was actively trying to seek out other writers for Halston the show and he never found one that he 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 liked he never found one that had the right voice that had the right jokes that just he he couldn't do it he couldn't give it up so he ended up becoming the sole writer of Halston all the way until our graphic novels Greg Wright is the first person to um to write uh in Adam's, you know, voice essentially for the, the style of the show, knowing that also at the same time, we can take this no budget. We can take the, you know, the comic places the show can never go. We can go as crazy and as wild as we want. And we take advantage of that. And, and it kind of gives the reader a, a chance to like have the characters and the humor from the show, but also be able to, to, to get something totally different and fresh at the same time. And, uh, but because Adam is so, um, just so protective over his, his, his incredible IP that he's developed. He, um, he's definitely involved, you know, from the beginning and, uh, and has his, his say through script phase and art phase. And, uh, and all that being said, it's such an easy, easy person to work with, easy job. We all love Holliston so much. It's never a chore. Uh, we, we all want it. So episodes and all these callbacks to characters and, and, uh, and, you know, Adam's been awesome about it. Yeah, we're lucky. Do you guys ever go back and watch old episodes of Holliston to get into the feel to, to do the, the, the book? All the time. Yeah. Um, when, when we're doing the art, especially, um, we'll pick different angles in the apartment. And I can't tell many times that apartment in the show is loaded with little tiny things in the background there's always stuff all over that apartment and i have to constantly sit there and try to figure out <laughs> like oh okay that's what this poster on the wall is or i'm like pausing and screenshotting every second you know as the camera moves trying to to see different things um it's uh yeah but i i've watched the show just a hundred times easily um and it never gets old either <laughs> no it doesn't I, I was surprised that was when my wife she walked in i think i was watching the christmas episode and she's like that's really sad and and endearing i'm like yeah you need to watch the rest of the show <laughs> <laughs> yeah there's a lot of heart in in Austin for sure and, and and you know you're right you know trying to trying to write 
you know, semi-autobiographical stuff and let somebody else write about you would have to be super hard. Um, the other one I, I liked um, that just dropped today was uh, uh, Tales of the Dead Astronaut. I, I picked that up on a whim. I didn't know anything about it. I just seen it in previews, picked it up, and I'm, I'm loving it so far. Um, and then, of course, your whole uh, Cult of Dracula, now Rise of Dracula. Uh, all that fun stuff. Um, yeah, pretty excited that Rise is finally here. It, it's been I, highly anticipated. I'm not going to lie, man. You're, the cover artists that you have got on Rise of Dracula, these guys are phenomenal. Um, I mean, this is the new one. I think I got the um, FOC for um, the one. I think it's in the New Order book. You're just like, wow, this is really good stuff. Um, <laughs> so, um, thank you. <laughs> so, now, how did you guys did? did was uh, Dracula somebody pitched it to you, or was this an in-house? Or you know, so it had. Um, it, it was originally intended to be published by second sight um and they had gotten it was creator owned book uh and rich davis was project managing everything and himself the writer and they had two completed issues um and then uh things things didn't work out with second sight uh and it never went through distribution um although there was some printing of of the first couple issues and then we took it over we uh reprinted issues one and two and put them out into distribution with new covers. And then um, from there, um, we ended up kind of taking over the project management and working really closely with Rich Davis. And he, there was just a lot of things went wrong. Um, uh, first, his, uh, his, his artist um, got COVID and uh, was just kind of out of the game. He was in really bad shape and he fell really behind um, in schedule we put on a monthly a tight monthly schedule for the book and uh he ended up leaving the book um and i pulled in uh Puiz calzada to to take over on the art and um Puiz is a great guy and somebody i've been wanting to work with for a long time uh and he was doing um we have a mutual friend adam green uh he was working on hatchet uh for american mythology and um, he was kind of on, on a little hiatus uh, waiting for the next project from them. And it was, the timing was just right. So um, uh, I brought him onto the project. And then it was shortly after that, uh, that Rich's original colorist ended up having to leave too. So um, I was on the hunt for a colorist and I was trying to find somebody who could dive right in right away because we we're on such a, you know, such a tight timeline. And finally I went to Puiz and I said, okay, I know a million colorists, but I'm struggling to find somebody who's available right now. Do you have somebody that you, you have enjoyed working with who you think might be available? And he said, well, you liked my work on Hatchet. Did you like the colors on Hatchet? I said, yeah. And he's like, well, well then we should talk to Alex Eif. So he ended up taking Alex Eif onto the project too. And at the same time, we brought in a, a, a new letterer as well, David Lentz. Uh, and Dave, Dave does a ton of lettering for us. Um, so, and he's just phenomenal and he does a lot of cool uh, design work and logo designs and all sorts of stuff. He's just a brilliant graphic designer. So we ended up kind of reshaping the creative team and, and taking a big lead in it, but we kind of, I would say like co-project manage with Rich Davis himself, and it's still a creator owned, uh, comic. We don't, we don't technically do it in house. It just kind of feels that way sometimes, <laughs> uh, but, uh, but yeah, I, I couldn't be prouder of, of that book. We kind of, it, it, it went, it had the worst of luck in the early stages and we kind of were able to kind of salvage it and turn it into um, just one of the biggest hits we've ever had. Yeah. Uh, the other one was, uh, I think two weeks ago, Good Boy. Uh, <laughs> yes. That is, uh, that book is just a ridiculous amount of fun and uh, people seem to get it. They're just, they're, they're in on the joke. They, they, they also think it's fun. It's a, it's a attractive. People are jumping on it. They're like, all right, I've got, I've heard about this thing. I have to read this. Let's see what it's all about. And then they're like, oh, wow, this is more than just a silly joke or satire or something. This is, this is actually really good. I want to keep going. <laughs> so it's great. 
it's, it's one of them books that's that's uh you, once you get you know you're like you the 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 joke hooks you and then the story keeps you keeps you keeps you hanging on so i'm i'm right. <laughs> really into that one um now you do you have artists you know you talked about the artist you had on dracula do you have artists that you you know you're just like i need to keep keep this guy busy i got to keep him working his stuff is just great or their stuff's great i should say yes uh so kit wallace um who is the artist on good boy um we are doing every single thing in our power to give him so much work that he never goes anywhere else ever <laughs> um He's, uh, he's absolutely incredible, um, penciler, inker, and colorist, and he's just a, a brilliant mind. Um, for those who, uh, who want to check out more of his stuff, um, I recommend our comic series, Warcorns. Um, he ended up coming on and doing, there was, Warcorns was a, originally a one-shot comic that was meant to be in the same world as our comic, Franklin and Ghost, but it was so popular and such a hit that um, it turned into a mini series and we brought on Kit uh, for the mini series. And then we did another one shot uh, after that, that Kit also did. And then uh, Kit's already working on more Warcorns as well as some other titles for us too. Um, uh, we have a comic coming called Christmas Carolyn and uh, he's working on that and, um, and a few other surprises that haven't been announced yet. He's, he's, uh, he's great. Yeah. We're, we're keeping him, very very busy <laughs> when you keep keep busy keep drawing this stuff you can't go nowhere else i need this stuff done right yeah <laughs> um, now i got the 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 i guess the elephant in the room uh how was getting uh source point out there with um you know did you have to start learning new ways to really approach people when when you couldn't go to conventions and stuff like that oh man yeah um Whew, COVID was a game changer in so many ways. Um, so there was, there was a time when things were really bad and uh, the, a lot of the stores were closed and there wasn't, there were still a lot of questions in the air as to when it would be safe to reopen. Um, their uh, diamond uh, kind of shut down for a little bit. Mm -hmm. um, publishers were stuck wondering what to do if they should keep printing their books, if they should keep uh, trying to meet their release dates while a lot of stores weren't open to be able to take the books, um, if they should just hit the pause button. And the problem with the pause button being, it only takes a couple of months of the pause button to wreck a small publishing company. You might end up never coming back from it. Uh, so it's, it was just, it was a really scary time. We were in a really tricky spot and we, we decided to keep trying to meet our, our release dates, keep printing our books line printing with or without diamond, whatever we had to do. And then just working on putting all of our efforts into trying to help the shops and figure out the best way to deliver our books and get them in their hands. So during that time, we, we did a lot of outreach. Uh, we did a lot of, uh, we had no choice, but to do switch to a lot of web sales and really focus on our, our web store. Um, so we, we started a program right away um, as we started sinking all of our efforts into our web store, we, we asked every customer to basically leave the name and city of a comic book shop that they wanted to support in the notes of their order. And then what we would do is we would treat it as if they had bought the, the books directly from that store, uh, as if that store had bought it wholesale from us. So basically we would just take half of the money that, um, that came in and we would just PayPal it to that store, no strings attached. It didn't, doesn't even matter if that store even carried our books. Um, if that's the store you want to support, then that's the store you just bought it from is what was our, our thinking. And, uh, on top of that, we went through and we cleared out our entire warehouse of all of our trade paperbacks. And we put together these big giant gift boxes full of graphic novels and we just started shipping them to comic book shops for free saying, do whatever you want with them. If you want, like use this as an opportunity for you to experiment with sales. If you are in a city, in a state where you can't have your doors open right now, then um, you want to try out like raffles and you want to try on Instagram or you want to try out Facebook live auctions or whatever it is you want to experiment with. Here's some free product at a time when you can't get new product uh, and do what you want with it. Um, we, we also, um, we were trying to find ways to just kind of help and support. 
uh, in such a strange and, and scary time. And what we were finding was that um, there was a ton of paramedics early on uh, that were going to the scenes of all these different houses where people were in cardiac arrest or, or were so sick that, you know, they couldn't breathe. And, uh, and as a result, there was a time where loads of paramedics yeah. their job. You know, and kind of be. So we, um, we talked to some places and figured out where, where the best place would be to ship uh, gift packages to um, all of these paramedics who were either in the hospital or quarantined at home. And we sent them all free books uh, to kind of read and keep it going. And for a bit, there was early on, there was a big mask shortage. And so uh, I was talking to one of our game factories um, that manufactures a lot of our stuff for us. Mm -hmm. And um, they ended up shipping us just cases and cases of masks uh, that I then took to, um, uh, I took to a whole bunch of different places to try to give out masks and just, just help out and, you know, wherever it was needed. And all this was great. It was our, it was our chance to try to figure out what can we do to help in a situation like this when we're just a, an entertainment company, you know, we're here to, we make funny books. It's not, it's not like we uh, make a big difference in the world. Right. So on top of that, we had to figure out how to survive and how to make money. And conventions were for our particular publishing company, our number one uh, revenue stream. We, we hit the roads harder than any publishing company I know. Uh, we were doing, uh, the year before COVID, we did 77 conventions, um, which is more weekends than there are in a year, obviously. So that means there were some weekends we were in four different states at once or sometimes multiple countries. And uh, when, when it got cut off, when, um, when COVID hit and it shut down all the conventions at once, we were we had people on a plane landing in Ireland, uh, where we had just shipped pallets of product, and they got off the plane to find out that the can they just canceled convention that day. Uh, we didn't even have the money to ship all the product back home. We had just shipped a bunch of product to Seattle. It got stuck there. We couldn't get refunded for majority of the hotels that we you know had already booked and uh, and flights and everything, all of our travel, we were stuck. Not only were we relying on the income that we would have made at those, but we also were, were just losing, bleeding out, you know, actual product and actual money. You know, a lot of people don't realize just the cost of shipping the products, you know, across the country. Uh, as soon as you ship it back across the country, which it was never intended to do, it was intended to be sold. You've now just lost all of your profit margin and then some, it would be cheaper mm. to light it on fire, you know? Uh, so it's, uh, it, it was a big, big, big hit, you know, kick in the gut. Um, so we really had to kind of um, figure out the best way to give that experience. Like how do we, we are, we sell best when we're talking directly to our readers. We sell best when we, when they can hear how passionate we are about our stuff. So we started doing these, um, these live auctions on Twitch and Facebook, um, where we would have a guest, uh, a guest creator zoom in with us, uh, you know, every other week and we would have cool rare variants and, and we would just do signings there in person for people. We would sell rare, like original artwork and concept sketches. And we would just try to pull in as many cool and unique things as we could to try to keep us afloat. And what we found was that our creators loved it and they were starting to donate things. We were just getting packages left and right. Hey, here's a, a cover I did for you guys two years ago, or here's whatever. They were just sending us all this amazing stuff and we would just throw it into the next auction. And it was, it was amazing um, how supportive people were and uh, you know uh, how excited they were to, to make this part of their regular thing because they were stuck at home too. You know, they were missing the scene as well. Um, and then for our, our board game company, we started playing our games with people, you know, over Twitch. So, you know, it, people would, would pull out their game and they would, you know, they would zoom in with us or whatever. And, and, uh, and everybody would just play together and we would start focusing on games that, that was, you know, we were able to do that and it kind of became a, a community builder. And, um, uh, that was something we didn't really do before. You know, we didn't have that much of an online focus and we started kind of just trying to build out our convention family in a different way. And I'm really proud to say that it all worked and that we survived and came out the other end uh, pretty strong. Yeah. 
I, I completely know how that, that is. Um, I remember the day, um, weekend of my anniversary, my wedding anniversary was the weekend Ohio got shut down. Wow. Um, I remember going out with my friends after we closed up the shop on Saturdays and I'm like, you know, this is probably the last time we're gonna be able to do anything. And they're like, Oh, you know, I don't know. And you know, it's, 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 you know, it's Ohio. It's not going to be that bad. Um, Sunday we were, me and my wife were coming back from the movies and they were like, um, Ohio shutting down Monday at midnight. I'm like, all right, well, I gotta go to the shop. I got to make as much money as I can today. So I'm telling everybody, I'm like, if you want books, you want whatever you got, your file that you need to come pick up, you need to get in here and get it today. Because <laughs> um, we went from uh, full in-store, then we went to uh, be able to do curbside, and then he took curbside away from us. And uh, I was doing deliveries to people's houses, um, just whatever I could. Oh. Um, and like you said, with conventions, my last convention was uh, December we were supposed to have one, like, I think like two weeks after the shutdown, we had a convention plan. Um, and it was, it was not fun. Cause I, you know, like you said, you still got bills coming in and no money. I yeah. mean, you know, utilities and rent never stopped coming in while I was working, you know, while I didn't have customers. So, but luckily my customers were like, Hey, I was posting stuff on Facebook and like eBay. And I'm like, Hey, I just got this stuff in. And they're like, all right, sh here, I'll PayPal you the money. I was like, all right, I'll drop it off at your house on my way home. So I would <laughs> wow. have to make my trips after I got off, got off work. And, um, you know, it, 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 it is, was a new way of learning how to sell. I wasn't that much of, uh, putting everything I, I got in on eBay uh, you know, cause like I always thought, Oh, you know, your, your regular customers, your people that come in, you know, they deserve. And then now I'm like, as soon as I get stuff in, it's up on Facebook. I'm letting people know what I got in. I'm like, tell me what you want. And, uh, you know, you can hold it. You get 24 hours, uh, unless you pay for it on PayPal or, or, you know, credit card, I can do all that stuff. And, and then, uh, like you said, I was, I was happy with, uh, uh um, a lot of companies were doing the, uh, the gift packages, getting them out there and stuff like that, um, getting you some product, even if there wasn't, you know, if it was a trade paperback, nothing, maybe not, maybe not new books, but, you know, something to, you know, get you to sell to help you kick your, kick you a little further down the road. So, and I do appreciate <laughs> that for, for all the other businesses out there and stuff like that. We, we greatly appreciate all this help at, that, that publishers and, and, uh, game store or uh game publishers and stuff did that that helped us a lot during that period of time so <clears throat> it's definitely a testament to uh an industry that that surviving and 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 finding new ways to to keep it going and and that just kind of really goes to show what a community it is uh i was i was rooting for everybody i was like i want every single small publisher to come through on the other side of this i want you know, we were all in it together and we were just like, oh, this is, this isn't about like letting the strongest survive or, you know, we were calling the herd or anything. It's like, no, we all need to figure out how to make this work. It's important to the future of, of comics. Yeah. Um, you know, that's what we, we talk about that a lot, almost weekly at my shop. We, we go on about, um, you know, the, the strength of the market and, and, you know, <sighs> you have to have people collecting, you know, and, and I, I own a store, you know, yeah, I want come people to come in and buy a thousand dollar book off my shelf. You know, I want that. Don't get me wrong, but you know, that's not where I make my money. My money is the guys who come in every week, they get their files, they order stuff, you know, it's, it's, you know, it's, it's, your dedicated fans, not just, you know, your speculators who go, Oh, you know, this will put my kid through college, you know, right. <laughs> I have thousands upon thousands upon thousands of books that I know aren't worth anything. They mean the world to me. I'm not going to get rid of them. You know, I've read. I don't know, a hundred thousand books in my lifetime or more. <laughs> so, <laughs> uh, but it, it's, it, it is good seeing publishers not fighting amongst themselves, trying to get that little, you know, 
inch, you know, that little piece of the market and stuff like that. Cause you know, I'm, I'm not gonna lie. I'm, I'm getting old. And I remember when uh, Marvel's whole thing was they put out so many books a month that made it so that you as a, as a buyer weren't going to buy independent books. So I remember that whole, that was their whole marketing. They just, oversaturated the market to the point where you know that's why you had the market implode at one point so but you know like i said it's good seeing people like hey you know we know our niche we want people to read our stuff and you know yeah we want them to, to prosper too we want this guy over here to prosper yes good we'll keep on going so um that's awesome you know Thank you. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. It's, uh, it's, it's, it's a small, a lot of people don't, don't really realize until they're in it too. The comic industry is super small. I mean, it's not a place to make enemies in that's for sure. <laughs> you know, uh, it's like, it's like just pooping in your own backyard kind of situation. You, you there's, uh, there's lots of great people at lots of great publishers are they our competitors? Yeah, I suppose if you want to consider it that way, when people are trying to dig up one pie and they're trying to like slice it and figure out how big is my slice of this pie. Um, and I think one of the things that we try to do is just, we just try to create our own pie too, you know, <laughs> like, sure, we can all fight for this one pie, but what if we just had a second pie over here? <laughs> what if we could convince people that they want more comics than they did previously instead of trying to figure out what which of the five this week they're going to get and uh and how can we how can we just encourage that readership all around you know create new customers in general and just bring more people to this because comics are the best storytelling medium in the world and and that's the root of it if anyone enjoys any form of entertainment then there's a comic book out there for them if they think it's all about superheroes and that's not their stick they're wrong there's there's all sorts of cool stuff and one of my favorite things uh, about horror conventions, horror movie conventions, is um, while they're not big money makers for us, we fans, they're certainly not. They're not necessarily uh, all the same people who will go into a comic book store every week. Um, but that doesn't mean they're opposed to it. They they don't buy comics regularly, but that doesn't mean that they wouldn't. So it's they're great people to introduce new things to um, because they're passionate about a genre. They're passionate. Oh, well, you know, if I haven't already heard of you, then you must not be a big enough deal for me to pay attention to. But there we go. We got you back. I lost you for a okay. couple minutes there. To, to, to truncate that, basically, uh, horror fans are a great example of, of people who want. All right. You were talking about horror conventions and horror fans where I lost you. Yeah. So, so what I was saying was basically that you know, sometimes there can be, uh, with old school comic fans, there can be kind of an elitism of, of, you know, it, who should I give my attention to? Oh, I haven't heard of them before. So they must not be that great or cool. And then you go to a horror convention. It's the opposite. They, they want the most underground thing they, you know, that they've never heard of. They're, they're on top of it. And, uh, and it's just a great, uh, example of, of anybody who's passionate about anything, uh, in a storytelling medium, we'll find a comic for them if they're if they're looking, and it's, sometimes they're not looking, so we have to kind of go to them. And uh, there's nothing more fun than convincing new people to start going to their local comic book shop uh, to find comics they probably didn't even know existed. Uh, you know, when they were so convinced that it was always Marvel and DC, and that that was the only world for that. You know, for this. You know, and there isn't. There's something for everybody. Yeah. Um, I remember um, you talked about that. Uh, my wife met me at my first comic book store that I was part owner of. And um, she was like, I thought comic books were like superheroes for kids. I'm like, no. And then I introduced her to like, um, you know, um, Razor and Faust and Cry for oh, Dawn cool. and, um, you know, caliber stuff. So, uh, the crow and you know she was like oh this is something a lot bigger than i could ever imagine you know and um i had people i worked with you know who were like oh man because you know i'd be the one who would take off and 
And like, I got a convention I got to go to, you know, I need to make sure I'm off this weekend. And they'd be like, oh, what are you doing? And then I was the one that got them hooked on reading comics. And and uh, then they found stuff that they liked and it just kept, you know, so it, it, is, it is, there is more out there than, uh, you know, Superman and Batman and Iron Man and Thor and all that fun stuff. So, okay. <laughs> okay. Uh, I was saying, I'd love to, I'd love to get all Evil Dead licenses and bring them all under one roof. I know Space Goat had Evil Dead 2 for a long time and, and Dynamite has Army of Darkness. I would love to grab those all up and just kind of like start from the beginning and do one really cool ongoing series that kind of brings those licenses together, Evil Dead 1, 2, and Army of Darkness. And that'd be really fun. Um, but that's just me being a big horror fan and nerd. Um, it'd be really, really great to get Street Sharks into a Street Sharks comic. <laughs> I feel like that's right for a comeback. <laughs> oh yeah, get Vin Diesel to come in and do the advertising for it. <laughs> uh. There's a ton of great cartoons from that era that need to come back, like Biker Mice from Mars. That would be really cool. The Cowboys of Moo Mesa. <laughs> all the, all the, uh, um, uh, the, the, what was the Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtle knockoff ones that they came out with there for a while? Better? Yeah. <laughs> oh, sorry about this. It's terrible. <laughs> It's 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 the I can I can hear you and then the uh, the picture will catch up with your voice. So, gotcha. <laughs> oh man, you were talking about the um, I wrote a um, a book a few oh god I don't know how long ago it was god twenty years ago now probably. Um, I wanted to bring all the forgotten eighties uh, television like heroes together under like an Avengers style <laughs> characters. <laughs> So I was going to use like Manimal and Werewolf <laughs> and Street Hawk and, <laughs> and uh, I the, then I went about the the trying to find out how much it was going to cost to license any of these characters and then I was like oh never mind because <laughs> <laughs> like Glenn A Larson is not cheap and he created Manimal so ah <laughs> uh, all right um, other one. Money's no object. What writer or artist are you? Are you? Would you? Would you want? Oh man. Um. Uh, oof. I'm a big fan of Stuart Eminem. Um, I would love to to have him on pretty much anything. Um, I would really love to have. Uh, Steve Niles do something for us. And that's like, I don't want to say obtainable because I, I think Steve is huge and he's just, that's like a, a, you know, a pipe dream type thing. But I, I do think that someday we will be able to make him a good offer um, and, and maybe pull him in on something. I'd really, really like to work with Steve Niles. Um, uh, I would say like way up there shooting for the stars, Neil Gaiman. I would really, really love to publish something new from Neil Gaiman. I think that would be incredible. And I would love to bring uh, Vince Locke back to do a project uh, under us, a Neil Gaiman story, you know, you know who's one of the, the old Sandman artists. Yep. Plus, I just love Vince, especially for, you know, Midwestern guys. That's, you know, Vince is just a good dude. Uh, so, yeah, I think that would be really, really cool to do a, a Neil Gaiman, Vince Locke comic book. Yeah. I've, I've met Vince. I'm, God. How many times over the years between uh um motor city and mid ohio con and yeah <laughs> and uh, back when mid ohio con was mid ohio con before uh wizard took it over and uh, <laughs> destroyed it <laughs> that's something else um all right um any advice for since you're now the editor-in-chief uh you got a guy who comes to you wants to break into comics what do you what do you want to tell him um, that unfortunately creator doing, doing self-published creator own work is the best way to get into the industry. Um, no one is likely to just grab your ideas and say, you have wonderful ideas. Here's a check. Uh, 
Nobody publishes ideas. Um, yeah, I, you know, I've been telling some of my friends that are, that are, you know, putting out books and stuff like that. I'm like, you need to let, you know, people see, you know, your creator own stuff and maybe see if they'll pick it up, you know, cause I, I don't, you know, I, I usually just take my friends with me to, I used to take my buddies with me to big conventions all the time and let them like, all right, there you go. There's the publisher room. Have at it. <laughs> I gotta go it, it, it works. I mean, I can't tell you. So as far as the in-house books that we do, every, most of the people that we hire to create these in-house books, they are creators of creator own work that we've published in the past we're not just grabbing new names out of a stack. You know, we're working with people who we know uh, they have follow through and there's no better way to prove that by, than by self-publishing. Anybody who's self-published anything, I have an instant respect for, uh, regardless of the quality of the product, because you finished a thing and that's huge. And that's the first way to get my attention is to show me that you can, you can go through all the stages of the process. But what, what we find is just that Anybody who's gone through it a couple of times on their own, they get the hang of it and they realize how long it takes and what, what they need to do to, uh, to kind of become more time efficient and make this work. And, um, that, that proves a lot to people. So good. Don't wait for the opportunities to come to you, make them yourself by making, making it yourself and then you know, bringing it out there to the world. Uh, that's how you, that's how you kind of get your foot in the door. Even if the publisher doesn't pick book, uh, it's always looks good to know that you've followed through and made something on your own start to finish. All right. Um, since we're experiencing some technical difficulties here tonight, um, why don't we uh, call it a night on this episode and uh, we'll work on it. We'll, we'll have you back again and uh, we'll see if we can figure out all this stuff. Cool. Yeah, sounds good. Sorry about this. No, I'll definitely it's, sort this. Out. It's, it's all right. I've I've had it. Uh, I had it real bad. I was trying to do an interview with somebody that was out in California, so I'm, you know, I'm filming them at, at uh, almost midnight, and my end is choppy. I couldn't do nothing. Everything was off in my house except for my computer, and I still couldn't get a strong enough signal to to do anything with. And I'm like, I'm sorry. All right. <laughs> My bad. <laughs> no. um, but yeah, I do appreciate you guys. Um, I'm, I like what you guys are putting out. Um, I, like I said, I am a big fan of Rise of Dracula, the Tales of the Dead Astronaut, which, I mean, only on issue two of that. So look at that. Product placement. Uh, <laughs> and uh, <laughs> Holliston. Uh, I, I kind of want to say Holliston has got me how I got to know you guys and find you guys. Uh, cause I think I got oh, friendship cool. is tragic and then I've just started finding all your other stuff that you were putting out. So, but thank you. Oh, that's awesome. man! thanks so much. Thank you. All right. And, uh, I'll let you go and <laughs> we'll, we'll, we'll have another episode down the road when we, uh, we'll get this all figured out. Okay. Okay, sounds good. We'll do this again. Thank you. Cool. cool. Thank you. Have a good night, man. Take care. You Take too. Care. All right. Thank you, Joshua, for the 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 interview. Of uh, we are very sorry about the uh, uh, technical difficulties. We will have Josh back again uh, for maybe another interview. We'll have some better questions and stuff like that. Maybe some more product will be out. Maybe I can I can throw some of that up. Um, but as always. Group Therapy TV podcast is brought to you by Are You Game, the best comic book collectible all around geek shop in Pitwell, Ohio. Now with a thousand times more percent of link memorabilia than we did two days ago. Um, and as always, follow me and watch me on my other show, Saturday Morning Serials, every Saturday morning at 8 a.m., uh, I might be working on another show. We're trying to figure out the, the logistics on that one, but you may see me on a show called Sci Fridays. So hang in there. And I will see you guys all next time on the Group Therapy TV podcast. And a big thanks again to Joshua. And we'll put some of his information here at the end. So take care and we will see you next week. <laughs>